Morning. We apologize for a late state starting here, but uh, this is the Crossroads of the Nation's Church, and we're celebrating the one-week Japan culture here in Nashville. We have four guests, or at least three guests, coming to share a little bit about Japanese culture. First one is literature, second one is sports, third one is history, fourth one is music. So we trust that this will be of interest to everybody. And our first speaker is Joseph Nugent, and he is going to speak about uh, the difference between Western and Japanese storytelling. As we all know, animation is very popular in Japan, and there's a lot of anime stories. So, Joseph, if you could come forward and uh, share a little bit about his uh, research on this topic. So, thank you. Ohayou gozaimasu. Uh, so yeah, as Pastor, as uh, Stephen Sensei said, I'm um, going to share a little bit about uh, you know anime, and uh, but more so the difference between Eastern storytelling and Western storytelling. Um, now, when I was in middle school and high school, people thought I was a little bit weird for liking anime or watching wuxia movies and things like that. But um, since I've gotten older and become a teacher and worked with middle school and high school kids, I'm I was quite surprised to find that you know anime and all that has become very popular. I mean, when I was when I was younger, it was certainly not as popular. And uh, so, you know, th there are a few theories to why that is, to why people find. You know, maybe anime, maybe kung fu movies, you know, Eastern forms of storytelling, so appealing as opposed to, uh, to Western forms of storytelling. Um, but one thing you might ask is, you know, why is this an important topic? You know, I mean, it's just stories, right? But, well, you know, stories, myths, legends uh, can tell a lot about a culture, can tell tell us a lot about who we are as people. And if, and if you want to learn about a culture, especially a different culture, you know, look at, look at their myths, look at their legends, look at their, their heroes, their gods, their villains, and things like that. So one of the most different, uh, or sorry, one of the, uh, the biggest differences between stories from the East, so China, Japan, India, what have you, or stories from the West, like Europe, America, even, even parts of Africa, is the concept of the conflict of a story. You know, the things that go wrong and how the hero attempts to fix it. And this is evident in anime, manga, or even, you know, American movies, American books, comics, what have you. But this goes back centuries, millennia even. These principles that I'm about to discuss can be most well exhibited in two of the greatest classics of world literature. That being the Odyssey, the, uh, the epic poem, which is largely considered kind of the foundational work of Western literature, in which the hero Odysseus, you know, goes off to fight in the Trojan War, and then after the war is won, he embarks on a long sea voyage to return home to his kingdom of Ithaca to rescue his kingdom and his family from those who would seek to steal it. We largely consider the Odyssey as the foundation of Western literature. But what about the East? Um, to truly grasp many of the concepts that I'm talking about, we'll be looking at the lengthy novel, uh, The Journey to the West, which is largely considered uh, one of the foundations of, uh, of Chinese literature and has, has gone on to, to influence um, many, other, many other forms of storytelling in that area. In that story, you have uh, the lands of the Tang Empire, which have become decadent, which have become sinful, and Buddha in heaven writes a series of, uh, of sutras, of scriptures, and he delivers it to a humble monk named Tripitaka. Uh, he delivers the sutras and he says, deliver this to the kingdoms of the West, which have fallen into sin and decadence. And so he embarks on a long journey with the help of various gods and creatures and heroes uh, to deliver this scripture to the sinful people of the West. On the surface, these stories seem kind of similar, right? We have a hero who embarks on a long journey and gets caught up in a series of, uh, of adventures and perils. Where do the differences come in? The differences come in when we look at the conflict and the characters. Let's start with the conflict. Yes, both conflicts and both works concern a long journey. Uh, 
but there's not as much peril in the journey to the West. And this is true of almost all Eastern and Western stories, whether we're looking at the journey to the West or whether we're looking at Naruto. (laughs) It's uh, simply a common theme that runs all the way through. In Western stories, the conflict is central to the work. Western stories will almost always begin in a world that is in conflict. In the case of the Odyssey, this is true. Odysseus uh, has to go on this long journey, not because he wants to, but because he has to. He went off to war, and after the war was won, he is on a desperate race to get back home to save his kingdom and his family from being stolen by greedy, powerful men. You do not have the story of the Odyssey without the conflict. But what about the journey to the West? Well, the journey to the, when the journey to the West opens up, it's a very peaceful opening. Things seem fine. The world doesn't seem to be threatened by some outside force. All we have is a, a kingdom of, you know, relatively lazy and decadent people. And Buddha, sitting on high heaven, decides, now oh, we're probably going to do something about this. He writes some scriptures, and he gives it to a monk to go deliver to it. The same can be said in many other uh, Eastern stories. Um, Whether or not you want to look at more ancient stories like uh, the Romance of the Three Kingdoms, the Mahabharata, the Tale of Genji, or even if you want to look at modern stories, if you want to look at modern uh, Japanese anime or many films coming out of China and Korea, when the movie opens up, it seems devoid of conflict. And instead of the hero seeing conflict ahead of him, and then going off to fight some villain or rescue some person in peril, the conflict more so finds them, and they are drawn out of their ordinary life to react to this conflict. As opposed to a Western story, you have a world racked with conflict, and then you have a hero, oftentimes not so much an ordinary person, but a powerful king, a powerful warrior, who sees wrong in the world and then goes off to fight it. In the case of Odysseus, he's off at war, fighting an enemy. Once war is completed, he must return home. The conflict follows him. The conflict is present from the beginning of the story. In the case of Journey to the West, the monk Tripitaka is simply minding his own business, living in his monastery, tending to his garden, feeding the hungry. All seems right in the world until, out of nowhere, Buddha comes down from heaven, gives him these scriptures, and says, go on this long, perilous journey and take these to the people of the West. Pretty different, talking about conflict. Not only that, but uh, the way the characters are handled in both Eastern and Western uh, stories are different. Um, In Western stories, it will almost always focus on one single character. You know, in literature, we'd call that the protagonist. The characters around him are trivial. They may be important, but they don't really have much of a bearing on the story. In Eastern stories, however, it is much different. In Eastern stories, there is a, uh, there is, there is a curious reoccurring principle that uh, in Japanese is known as the nakama, which are the character's friends, the character's allies, those who travel along with him or her to help them. And these Nakama are very important characters. They'll be unique. They'll be fleshed out. And if one of them dies or if one of them exits the story, it'll be a big deal. In the case of the journey to the West, the monk Tripitaka is joined by the monkey king, Song Wukong, a river spirit named Sandy, a pig monster, and a magical horse dragon. These are all very important characters who have a lot of bearing on the story. But in the case of Odysseus, he's really the only character. Yes, he's a king, and he has a great many soldiers and sailors that go along with him on his journey, but none of them are even so much as given names. And when they die, and they all die at the end of the story, the audience is not really affected. You're not really sad because you didn't really know them. And when more important characters are introduced to the story, the second they leave, you practically forget about them. The story focuses on Odysseus. 
And the same can be said, once again, in modern media, whether or not you're looking at Japanese anime, or you're looking at uh, American movies or books or what have you. Uh, in Japanese anime, a very common staple are the supporting characters who support a protagonist, who help him along with his journey. This might include a mentor, a love interest, a best friend. And in Western media, you will have supporting characters, but once again, they will not play as, as big of a role. And this goes back to those key themes of conflict. In a Western story, you have a world in conflict, a world shrouded in darkness. And you have a single hero who sees the darkness, sees the evil around him, and decides to do something about it. In the case of Eastern stories, you have an ordinary person living an ordinary peaceful life with friends around them. And then all of a sudden, their ordinary life is disrupted by something extraordinary. Whether that's uh, they get fired from a job, there's an alien invasion, what have you. So to bring this back around, how are they similar? And the similar thread through all stories, throughout history, throughout time, and throughout cultures, is the simple fact that in every story, there is conflict. In every story, the world is enmeshed in darkness. There is evil that seeks to disrupt peace and joy. There is evil that seeks to destroy. And there's always a hero who goes to fight it. Whether you're reading, watching a story made in the East or the West, there is always a hero who goes, rises up to fight the darkness. Whether or not that hero sees darkness and sets out to fight it himself or is simply living an ordinary life and darkness comes his way. And I think it's curious that throughout the entire world, this is a common thread. And I think that that harkens on, on something, something deep in us humans. Because let's face it, our lives are filled with darkness. Our world is filled with evil and turbulence. And though we may be just ordinary people, we may not be particularly heroic. We not, may not be a powerful king like Odysseus. We may not be a virtuous monk like Tripitaka. But we do crave for a hero. We crave for, for someone to come and right the wrong. All humans have throughout history. And uh, I think that you know, that's highlighted in the fact that in our own faith, we crave a savior. And thankfully for us, we have one in the form of Jesus Christ, of course. He is the hero who rights the wrong. The world shrouded in darkness, and God sends his son to right that wrong. God sends us a hero to combat the evil and to combat the darkness. If you read the Bible, and the Bible is a story, it is very much a, a literary work, though it is true and it is a work of history, it exhibits many of the traits of both Eastern and Western storytelling. There are a myriad of characters in the Bible, and many of them are simply just ordinary people. David is just an ordinary shepherd, and then one day, the prophet Samuel comes and proclaims him the king of Israel. Mary is just an ordinary woman going about her day, and then all of a sudden, an angel appears to her and says, you will bear the Son of God, and he will save his people from darkness. And even in our own lives, there will always come a time where we're minding our own business, and what do you know, some conflict comes our way, be that with our job, our, our family, whatever. And that we may not be particularly heroic, we can always look to the heroes of literature, but more importantly, we can look to our own savior, Jesus Christ, to make us the heroes we need to be, to combat the darkness, to fight evil in the world in whatever small way we may. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph, for that. And next is Matt Merton. Uh, Joseph talked about literature. Matt was a, or is a former professional baseball player who played for the Chicago Cubs, as well as uh, for the Hunching Tigers in Japan, made a well-known name for himself, broke Ichido's record for most hits in one season. 
So Matt will be sharing, and he lives here in Franklin. Thank you, Matt. Konnichiwa. It's always a pleasure to be here. Um, and Joseph, that was awesome. Uh, I really enjoyed the opportunity to listen to that. I find it fascinating uh, that as I listen in terms of culturally speaking, how stories are told uh, in Western culture versus Eastern culture, you can find parallels between that and also what you witness on the athletic field. Uh, from the concept of the individual uh, in Western culture uh, to the concept of the unity uh, or harmony that we, that we garner in terms of wa in the Japanese culture. Um, so that'll be something that I'll talk about a little bit as we get into uh, today. Uh, but first and foremost, I just, it's just fascinating to me to see the parallels between how we tell stories and then the culture that we actually engage with. Um, so as I said, I'm really grateful to be here. Um, there's a few things that I'd like to talk about today. Um, one being the game of baseball, um, which I had the opportunity to um, be a part of in, in Japan from 2010 to 2015. Um, I'm going to speak briefly about a very dark period of time uh, in, our, in our history in the sense of World War uh, that we were a part of in, the 19, in 1941 in Pearl Harbor, and then how a lot of those things uh, kind of coincide with one another and how we develop relationship with one another. Um, there was a book uh, named Wounded Tiger uh, that I had an opportunity to read. And in this book, uh, it, unp it unpacks historical events. Um, that greatly defined the friendship between our two nations, that being Japan and the U.S. Um, and in that, in that book, it went from, it, it spoke from how we went from enemies to allies. It was a story of a man that led the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941. And it talked about how he was forever changed when he recognized that the harmony that he so courageously fought for was not ultimately found in war, but it was found in the hearts of those that were destined to intersect with one another. So it's just amazing to me how there are these different vehicles, there are these different things in our lives that bring us together, that allow us to intersect with one another. And the game of baseball was that for me and my family. So a quick history on the game of baseball, uh, that being there in uh, Japan, it actually um, started by a young American uh, history English teacher named Horace Wilson. He introduced the fundamentals during the Meiji era, and a, and a gentleman by the name of Albert Bates was an American teacher, and they had their first formal game in Japan in 1873. Uh, Hiroshi Hiroka was the, uh, developed the first team in 1878, and that was the Shimbashi Athletics. So the game of baseball goes all the way back to the late 1800s there in Japan. Uh, the game unified and brought two cultures together. Uh, there were Goodwill tours there in the early 1900s with college players and even guys like Babe Ruth, who is a huge baseball figure here in the United States of America. He had gone over and played in Japan. And I recall as an athlete uh, being there in Japan, walking the hallways of Koshien Stadium and seeing pictures of Babe Ruth on the wall. Uh, he had spent uh, time there in Japan playing there at Koshien Stadium, um, and he did that in like 1934. So how amazing is it for myself, 75 to 80 years later, as an American, to be walking the same hallways, to be on the same playing surface as, as people like Babe Ruth and how the game of baseball brought us together. Um, there were those Goodwill tours, and then there were gentlemen, names like uh, Murakami, who came over here uh, to play in the United States from Japan. They went from Murakami to Nomo and Ichiro and Hideki and Darvish and Otani and all of these guys that we know have been able to experience both going from the United States to Japan as well as the Japanese coming to America. So there's this tradition. There's a tradition of players making trips around the globe and were unified uh, through the game of baseball. New cultures new opportunities, new privileges. I remember for myself personally, I remember before I went, uh, knew that I was going to ultimately be going to play baseball in Japan, I started the process of trying to understand what is this gonna look like? I remember making phone calls uh, to my uncle who had done international travel. I remember reading the book, You Gotta Have Wa. I remember watching uh, the movie, uh, Mr. Baseball, trying to embrace what is this culture that I'm about to step into? I remember my uncle gave me really good advice, and I think it's advice that we all need to, to adhere to, being that he said, never forget who you are and where you came from. He said, yet with that, he said, it's so important for us to have an openness and a willingness to engage the culture that we're stepping into. 
So that was my mindset as I went into Japan in that first year. I remember going and getting off that flight. And again, I've said this many a times, and all of the different things that we feel and sense as someone who steps into a new culture. It's a, it's a completely different language. And if we don't, aren't our privilege to know the language before we arrive, just how fast everybody feels like they're speaking. And you're just trying to navigate life. I remember going through and getting there and uh, meeting uh, Oki-san, who was our translator, and spending time uh, speaking and engaging with the media the minute that we had gotten off of the uh, plane. And I recognized in that moment how much baseball meant to the people of Japan. From there, going and just the day-to-day -day stuff, whether it was in the grocery store or trying to understand, okay, what kind of milk do I need to buy and what kind of um, where, where can I find food? And all of the very basic things that we try to figure out when we're first on the ground in a new country. But as I started to settle in and get engaged in the game of baseball, um, it was always fascinating to me, and I'm gonna spend a few minutes just talking about the differences that I noticed between the two uh, countries and how we did things in the US in baseball and then how things were being done there in Japan. One of the things that was very evident to me is that at the end of every day, it was Oskari Samade Shah. How hard we work mattered. And so when I showed up the first day in Okinawa and we were, we were training, the training that these guys took on were, was training like I had never seen before. In part, when the game was first introduced in the late 1800s, it's understood that one of the things that the Japanese really appreciated about the game of baseball was the opportunity to repeat in action over and over and over again. There's the opportunity to take a more of a militaristic approach to how we are going to refine our craft. And so that was very evident in day one when I was there in spring training was just how the Japanese culture embodied that nature of showing up every day, day after day, doing the same things over and over again to the point of trying to perfect a particular craft. I remember going out and we stretched. I, it was for 40 plus minutes. It was the longest stretch I'd ever been a part of. And the stretching was just the, the beginning of a long day going into all of our teamwork and all of the things that we did, and we went to have lunch. And I remember uh, sitting down to have lunch and realizing that the day was only half over. In the United States, lunchtime was time to go home. In Japan, it was just half, halfway point. So it was very evident at the very beginning of how often it was that we were gonna put in the time and energy necessary in order for us to be successful. I remember at the end of camp, going to my first game in Kyocera Dome, and standing on the line and the introductions and, and seeing all of the people and the passion that they brought to the ballpark. And the, the fact that in so many ways, Japanese culture, uh, from everything I experienced, they work very, very hard. And while they're at work, it is, very, um, it is very much so that they have to stay on task. And the Japanese control the emotions and they hold a lot of things in. And I always witnessed the baseball games where it was this opportunity to allow all of it to come out where when they were out there in the outfield and they were cheering on our teams, it was almost had this flair of this, this feeling of like this international soccer with the, with the flags waving and the bands playing. And it was a chance for the Japanese in a, in a moment of entertainment to allow all of the day's stresses, all of the day's works or whatever it was that they had going on to be released in that moment. So it was very interesting to watch a culture that was very, um, very much able to hold their emotion to be in that moment to allow it out, which was really cool. Um, some of the differences between playing in, in Major League Baseball and then playing in the NPB, and I've already stated it there at the beginning, which was in the United States of America, it's much about the individual and how the individual develops their own particular skills to meet the needs of the team. In Japan, it was much more about how the team works in unity with one another to accomplish the goal that they were trying to accomplish. I remember sitting in the locker room at times, and in the United States, we always had the watch and the clock up on the wall. We always knew what time stretch was gonna be, and we would, we would kind of monitor that for ourselves, and it was our responsibility to be there on that line at that particular time. And when, we got to, when I got to Japan, I realized pretty quickly that while there was a stretch time, the stretch time was somewhat irrelevant because what would end up happening was we'd be in the clubhouse or in the locker room and the guys would be sitting around hanging out together. And all of a sudden one guy would get up and he would walk out the door to go get ready for stretch. And before you know it, as soon as one got up and walked out, boom, everybody's getting up and walking out. And I'm like, well, what time stretch? And I'm starting to get all panicked in my spirit. Like, am I late? What am I doing? Am I missing something? And it became this thing that I recognized, which was whether stretch was gonna be at you know 1.10 in the afternoon 
uh, or, or whatever it may have been, that when the first person stood up to walk out, everybody walked out together. So it could have been 105, it could have been 106, 103. And then they went out there and I would feel late at times, like I wasn't on time to stretch, but it was this concept of, we gotta do this together. And so whether it was in how we trained or how we went about playing the game, uh, that was something that was very evident. And it, and it parlays back into how we tell stories, the individual versus the concept of the, all of the characters being very important in that story. So I go from that, those, those, that was some of the similarities and differences in how we trained and how we went about it. There were other things as well, and they, I found it fascinating. They said that, you know, a lot of times as athletes in Japan, it was more about, as, as a hitter, um, between the differential between strike and ball, that as a uh, Japanese athlete, they thought about ways that they could make a pitch look like a ball that end up a strike, and a pitch that looks like a strike end up a ball. Everything was about their way that they were going to mask or mirror what it was that they were doing. Where in the United States, it was more of this bravado of, here it comes, you're going to hit it. you got to hit it. And they would attack you in a different form. And so the game was almost a little bit like turned backwards. And I remember having conversations with teammates and uh, guys that were playing for different teams. And they said, hey, based on your experiences that you had here, what would you tell me? And I said, take everything that you know about American baseball and I want you to flip it. I want you to think about it like in an opposite direction because the counts are not leveraged the same way. The way that they think is not the same. And so the game is still the same game, but the way that we go about getting to an end result is distinctly different. They said that when kids would play their video game systems, that they had done some research. Now, whether they did this or not, I don't know, but they did research. And it was much more common for kids in the United States that were playing the game of baseball to throw balls into the strike zone to their friends. And it was kind of like this, oh, well, you're not being strong enough if you don't throw it into this particular zone. Whereas the children in Japan grew up throwing the ball outside of that zone. So it was just a difference in mentality. The United States is more, was more of this bravado that they carried on a day-to-day -day basis that in essence, when it really came down to it, the strength for the Japanese was more held in how they were able to control themselves, how they were able to control their emotions. Where in the United States, it was more about letting all of that out. So there was a lot of things that would occur over the years, and as an American stepping into a different culture, it's very easy. I think at the very beginning, it becomes one of these things where it's like a honeymoon phase. And you're accepted because, to some degree, you represent the Western culture. And then over time, it is that you are to more or less adhere to the Japanese way of doing things. And there will be moments that you run up against things just based on cultural differences. And it's understanding one another and it's understanding the differences that help us to get through those moments. So, in the sake of time, uh, the group mentality, one goes, all goes, how we would practice, uh, the pitcher's mentalities, and the list goes on and on and on. At the end of the day, though, the beauty is, is that through the game of baseball, that through a lot of different vehicles, at the end of the day, there's an opportunity for us to be able to be in relationship with one another. As it was stated in Wounded Tiger with that gentleman who led the attack on Pearl Harbor, it wasn't in recognizing the har that the harmony that he courageously fought for was found in war. No, it was actually found in, in the hearts of those that he was destined to intersect with. So what a beautiful opportunity when we talk about culture here, you know, in, during Japanese Culture Week to appreciate uh, other cultures, to be able to understand that there are different ways to go about getting from point A to point B. But at the end of the day, in our human spirit, we're all trying to get to the same place, right? At the end of the day, we all want to be loved. We all want to be recognized. We all want to be valued. All of those things still matter. And so for me and my family, when we look back on the six years that we had in Japan and we think about how we still have the opportunity to engage with the Japanese culture, we count it a blessing. We counted a blessing to have been able to spend the time in that culture, to have our eyes open to different things, to, to be able to grow uh, and, and experience things because of how we were stretched in moments. Uh, it was a blessing. And as a, as a follower of Jesus, as somebody who loves the Lord and knows that there's a specific plan and purpose for each of our lives, we knew that when we stepped into those moments, I remember standing on the ground in Japan. And while there are differences in culture, and there's differences, we're all human beings. And when I stood on that ground, I knew in that moment that the very ground that I was standing on was no different in the sense of where I was in America or in Japan or anywhere else for that matter. It was all put there by the same person, the creator God. And he had a specific plan and a purpose. And he utilized the game of baseball. He utilizes a lot of different things in our lives 
to allow us, to, our hearts, our, our being, who we are as people to be able to intersect with others. So what a beautiful opportunity this week to talk about culture, to be able to talk about the differences that we experience, recognizing that while we experience things that are different, deep down inside, we are all very similar. So I am so grateful to Japan. I am so grateful, my family and I, for all of the things that we were able to experience there. And one of the things I will say uh, in respect to the game of baseball and how I experienced uh, the culture of Japan through that game, um, it was fascinating to me to sit around a table to be eating one of my favorite meals, which was ramen, and to sit there with a group of guys that all came from different backgrounds, all came from different places. This was the little redheaded guy that grew up in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, that played Little League Baseball on a, on a, on a small field in Deerfield Beach. And these guys did it totally different. The rakes were wooden, mine were more aluminum. The way they trained was different. They trained every day from a young kid I trained, I trained in multi-sport. They probably did a little bit more in one sport. Like we all did things a little different, but yet here we are sharing the meal around the same table. And yet 20 plus years before that, 30 years before that, we were all going about our day to day and the game of baseball allowed our lives to intersect with one another. And as a believer, I know that the Lord put us there with a specific plan and with a specific purpose. So I'm forever grateful for that. What I will say in closing is this, is to the ones that have gone before us, to the next generation, may we be those that are able to help continue to bridge the gap in what is a wonderful relationship between the U.S. and Japan. Thank you so much. Thank you, Matt, very much for that. Here at this Crossroads of the Nations uh, church, we have two former missionaries to Japan. Neil Hicks has been a missionary in Japan for, uh, I don't know, 30 years. <laughs> and I've been working with Japanese in Japan and America and Australia for about 44 years now. So um, we've, we do a lot of thinking about the history of Japan and uh, the thinking of the Japanese. And uh, of course, our heart is that uh, we would love to see Japanese people be uh, interested in the Christian faith and, and know more about Jesus and not only know but actually uh, uh, trust him as their savior. But this is a little talk about history in Japan, the Shimabara and Amaksa insurrection. And uh, I had a handout here so uh, you could follow along with that. People may get desperate when they need food and have limited shelter. The desire to survive and provide for the family is human nature. In the 16th and 17th centuries of Japan, there were many peasants or farmers who grew rice and vegetables. Their territory was ruled by daimyos, and the people had to pay taxes with rice on their produce. They had to work all day, even had to cut wood for the samurai families. They could not even eat their own grown rice and had to pay taxes on the rice. If there was a drought or famine, the economic condition became severe and the people suffered. It was the practice of daimyos who were fair to negotiate the yearly tax with the peasants. The daimyo wanted to avoid any revolt or social upheaval. But not all of the daimyos were fair and sensitive to the peasant conditions. Shimabara is a peninsula, not far from Nagasaki. Also, not far from Shimabara are the Amaksa Islands. Under the direction of a Christian daimyo, Tsutsui, a vassal named Matsukura Shigemasa, was given the position to rule the Shimabara Peninsula. There were a number of Christian peasants given living on the peninsula as a result of the Roman Catholic Portuguese mission effort through the years. Matsukura tolerated the Christians until he received orders from Shogun Iemitsu to begin driving out the Christians from the peninsula in 1630. He became cruel against the Christians using torture, such as throwing them into the hot springs of the Unzen volcano. Matsuda 
died in 1630, and then his son, Shigetsuga, took over. He was even more harsh in his torture. He extorted money from high taxes and spent money in selfish ways. Also in the town of Shimabara, a new castle was being built, and higher taxes were demanded for that. There was great oppression against the peasants, and the Christians were persecuted, driving them into hiding in the mountains for safety. An influential man by the name of Sogoro went to Shogun Iemitsu to complain about the severe oppression that was happening. He and his family were ordered to be killed. A peasant was accused of not paying his taxes, so the tax collector and soldiers took his daughter and tortured her. These kinds of events led some peasants of the Shimabara Peninsula to attack the tax collector and all who worked for him. The insurrection led to attacking the town of Shimabara on December 17, 1637. The town was burned down. In the rebellion, there were a mixed group of peasants, fishermen, and ronin samurai who had no masters to serve. They were a group of both Buddhists and Christians. And about the same time, a similar insurrection, for the same reason, happened on the Amaksa Islands. They wanted to overthrow the tyrant Daimyo Terazawa, and this they did. They chose a 16-year-old boy as the new Daimyo, Masuda Shiro. A counterattack against them was made, but Shiro led them to victory. They then heard about the Shimabara Rebellion, and Shiro, with some 5,000 men, joined the Shimabara group. The shogunate, the shogunate army of 30,000 was sent to squelch the rebellion, so to protect themselves, this mixed group of Buddhists and Christians retreated to the unused castle of Hara on January 17, 1638. It's said that there were some 37,000 people who moved into the council. This included women and children, and there were perhaps 14,000 men available to fight under the leadership of Shiro. The Shimabara and Amaksa Ran or Ikki, which means insurrection, is dated from December 17, 1637 to April 15, 1638. For four months, those held up in the Harak castle were able to hold off the shogunate army of 125,800 men. Many area daimyos joined forces to make up the shogunate army. Some of the daimyos had been professing Christians, but they departed that faith and joined the shogunate who had been persecuting the Christians. Under the leadership of Matsudaira, after four months of siege, the castle was burned down. From February 24 to March 12, the shogunate had recruited the Dutch ship, the Derip, to attack the castle with cannon fire. The people in the castle ran out of ammunition and food and suffered terrible conditions. The Buddhist members were given the chance to leave if they wanted. And under severe outside threats, the Christians were urged to give up their Christian faith and surrender. But most of the occupants did not recant their faith, and it is said some 37,000 died from all the skirmishes and the final destruction. The shogunate forces under Matsudaira had 13,000 men who died or were wounded. All the surviving women and children were killed, and some 3,000 were beheaded with their heads displayed on poles to arouse fear against further uprisings. In the spring of 1639, the shogunate gave orders for no more Portuguese ships to enter Japan. All foreigners except the Dutch traders were ordered out of Japan and the Christian faith was strongly resisted. A growing fear that the Christian faith would destroy the Japanese society was felt and by 1650, the visible presence of Christianity came to an end in Japan. People recanted their faith were killed or went into hiding in the mountains. All people were forced to register at a local Zen Buddhist temple and each year the Shumon Aratame census was done to make sure the people submitted themselves 
to the local authorities. For some 200 years, Japan was isolated from foreign influence, the years of Sakoku. The reason for the social upheaval cannot be blamed solely on a religious conspiracy. The people were desperate by economic suffering and even exploited by the ruling daimyos. The high taxes and famines caused a restless sense of survival. This political injustice and unbearable taxation seemed to be a root cause of the Shimabara and Amaksa Ran. The freedom to worship was a genuine matter for survival, too, and it would not be until 1858 that there would be a sense of welcoming Christians to worship openly again in Japan. It is said that 80% of the Japanese are indifferent to religion. Only 8% are active in some religion, and 0.05% are Christian. Japan is a nation where for many years those in leadership have used religion to control and unite the people. It has caused problems, and certainly learning from mistakes of the past should help us. These mistakes should not lead us to indifference, but make us seek after personal spiritual truth for the good of the whole person, the family, and the nation. So a little bit of history, and I feel that perhaps one reason why the indifference of Japanese towards religion is part of their history, and this kind of history probably is not a good taste of religion on the part of Japanese people. So, この無関心、indifference は無関心ですね。で、なぜ日本人が無関心であるというと、多分こういうような歴史があるから。宗教がいろいろ問題を起こしましたのであんまり宗教に対して興味がないそれが大きい影響ではないでしょうかと私が思いますですから無関心にならないでぜひ心を開いて真理を求めてください OK that's my desire OK our last talk our last talk is Roger Roger Lowther and、uh, as I said、uh, Roger is a musician but he started the Christian arts community in Japan And he's written some books, some ch- books for children, and、uh, books in Japanese as well as English. So、uh, it is great that he can speak here on the topic of aroma of beauty. And he experienced recovery of the large tsunami and was very helpful in helping people recover from that. So he will share a little bit about his experience with the tsunami and. His ministry or his work in Japan. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, Stephen. It's wonderful to be here, to be able to talk with all of you who are here live and those of you who are watching online. So it was just before lunchtime in 1923 when a devastating earthquake struck the nation of Japan. But what came next was even worse. Because it was lunchtime, the gas burners were going around the city and the destroyed buildings immediately caught on fire. And a wall of flame raced through that city faster than anyone could escape. Pretty near my apartment building in Tokyo, there was a large group of people, 37,000, who gathered, hoping that the water from the river or the park would protect them. Unfortunately, it could not, and they were all caught and died. There's a memorial to them in the park today. I often run there to remember that event. Well, during that time, there was a famous author, novelist, Kikuchi Khan, and he had this to say about it In an emergency such as this earthquake, art is useless, to say the least. Our recent experience only helped expose the ultimate futility of all artistic endeavors. This quote was published in, a, in the newspaper, and I saw it in other places too on the web as people began to send it to each other. And it really struck me as an artist is this true? <laughs> is art useless in a disaster? 
I mean, you can see from the picture that's on the screen there that everything is burned to the ground. So if there is no wall to hang a painting on, are paintings useless? You know, if your instruments are burned to ash, is music useless? If there are no stages for dance performances or for us, um, plays, is there any meaning to it at all? Well, I got to see for myself whether this was true or not when another disaster struck Japan, those we all know, in March 11, 2011. It's hard to express the fear that we felt during that time. The, I had four young children, okay, and we were told by our neighbors, don't drink tap water. But there was no water anywhere to be had, bottled water. In fact, the shelves were empty of everything that you could want. Blackouts rolled through the city. We were told it's, you should not be outside in the rain because radioactivity was coming down from the skies. These are what the neighbors were saying. And yet we were all out there trying to fill trucks of relief supplies to bring up north. So we were often out in the rain, wondering how it was affecting us. So this disaster wasn't a wall of fire, but a wall of water, then followed by the nuclear disaster. So I found myself three days after the earthquake in a small shelter just outside of Fukushima. And I was driving all night. <laughs> Uh, it took us about 18 hours to get there because they had closed down the highways. And driving those local roads, we always had to be careful about holes that opened up in the road and cracks from the earthquake. Listening on the radio for broadcasts of other things that may be happening or what was happening with the nuclear power plants. I was tired. <laughs> I felt dirty from the mud. And when we arrived at this shelter and unloaded everything, there sat an old, sticky keyboard. Now, you wouldn't think that there's any role that music could play in a situation like that. And yet, I was asked to give a concert. I had no music with me at the time. I just had to make it up. And you know, I don't think I've played for a more appreciative audience the people yelled, bravo, you know, superashi, wonderful. And afterwards, so many people came up to talk with me. It was just an amazing experience. For that one moment, there was no earthquake. There was no tsunami. There was no nuclear radiation. Well, this experience continued for many months to come, I ended up spending six months in full-time work, then playing in shelters and bringing other artists with me. And there's one event in particular that stood out to me. We were in another nuclear power plant that had been shut down. It was just serving as a shelter. Exactly two months after the earthquake, at 2.46 p.m., we observed a minute of silence. Now, I'm an organist, and I've played for a lot of funerals, so I know what it's like to play for a group of grieving people. But this was much worse. Everyone was looking down. It was heavy with the burden. They didn't care if we were there or not. There was no desire for music. And it just it didn't seem right in that situation for music to break the silence that we were in. And yet the plan was, okay, we're supposed to do something. So uh, our, one of our musicians was a shakuhachi player, the man on the, on the left there in that screen. And he went to one side of the room, and he played a short melody. Do, 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 do. Kind of mournful. It echoed through the room. Another one of the musicians was a flute player as well, so he went to the other side of the room and echoed it back, but slightly differently. Again, it just resounded in the hall. Still, nobody moved. You can imagine in the complete silence to hear these melodies. 
Well, little by little, they played back and forth to each other, call and response, question and answer. Their melodies crisscrossed the room, flowing through the people. And the two musicians began to walk toward each other. And as they did, their melodies became more energetic and longer. And you could see people begin to sit up straighter. To become, you could tell they were listening and interested what was going on. And as the two met in the middle, then they formed almost like a little parade walking through the people. And as the music became more and more energetic, people responded with clapping and moving. They were being moved literally, not just emotionally, but physically as well as they began to clap along. That was one of the most powerful concerts I have ever been part of. And this picture here, I'm thankful for the photographer who was there at the time. You can see the little, the only sense of privacy they had were those little walls and they just walked these two musicians up and down every aisle. Well, people lined up to talk to us afterwards, telling us their stories of, of loss, but also survival, heroism, life, hope. It was a privilege to hear those stories. There was a young, one young lady, a high school uh, student, who said, I'm a flute player also. <laughs> she said very shyly, like, oh, we want to hear. Please play your flute for us. She said, mm, okay. <laughs> Hi. So she ran back to her space and dug through all the things she had left in the world, which was, you know, clothes, flashlight, water bottle, grabbed her flute, came back, and started to play for us. And pretty soon, the, the two flutists also joined in. And it was like this party had broken out in the middle of the room. And a group of women kind of circled around them and began to clap and laugh and even dance. You know? I mean, just moments before, they were in the depths of despair and now the height of exuberance. It was just amazing to see this contrast and the power that music had in that situation. So it never occurred to me that art could be useful, that it could even be necessary in a situation like that. And over the months after that too, I witnessed scenes like this over and over again. Sometimes it was exuberance but sometimes it was entire rooms of people bursting into tears, sometimes for the first time since the accident. It was clear to me that art and beauty were among those necessary things we had to provide in an emergency. And as the world unravels before our eyes, art can draw us together, and we can always carry this beauty to those who need it most. Now, I tell more of these stories in my book, Aroma of Beauty, um, and really, what was the impact that the arts had, not just music, but dance, and painting, and photography, and all the arts that you can possibly think of as people kept coming with us on these trips. This evening, if you're interested, I'll be speaking at Belmont University and how Kinski played a large role after the disaster. I'll be speaking the Lou Center for the Visual Arts, room 117, for those of you who can't see the PowerPoint or are just watching online. So it's tonight at six o'clock at Belmont University. The Golden Cracks, Japanese art of Kintsugi and its message. And it's just amazing to me when you look at what is happening in the world Today, you know, natural disasters are continually happening. A couple of weeks ago, I was down on the Gulf Coast at Gulfport, Mississippi, giving a concert. And Hurricane Katrina devastated that area in much the same ways that the tsunami did in Japan. And these stories resonated with them as I shared some of them in the concert. And of course, man-made disasters like 9-11 and Fukushima. But then all of us are watching with horror in the news what's happening in Ukraine right now. The man-made disasters of war and fighting. This is the kind of world that we live in, and yet there is hope. <laughs> 
we don't need to despair. It's not the end. Because various arts, especially the Japanese traditional arts, whisper of a way forward. And especially with the art of kinski, which is built at the very art form itself, that we have a cracked and fractured world, but that it can be repaired with veins of gold, that the glory of heaven may shine through, that there is healing, there is hope, there is life, and that somehow through our brokenness, this world can be made into something new. We can't really fix the cracks, but we can make it into something new that's better than it was before, you know, more valuable, more beautiful, stronger than it was before. So I'll be sharing more about kinski and some of the other Japanese art forms that also do this. I think there's a, a message here in the Japanese arts that helps us see how to live one more day in a world as broken as ours is. And here, as was introduced in the beginning, some of my books that talk about some of these things and my contact info. Thank you so much. Thank you, Roger, very much. So those who have some time left, we have curry rice lunch, and maybe Matt could stay for a few more minutes, and Roger can be here to talk with them a little more and look at their look at Roger's books and uh, join on the uh, Belmont seminar this evening, if you like. So thank you very much for joining us, and uh, have a couple all the way from Knoxville who've come. <laughs> Uh, thank you for joining us today, and the other people have a... And the uh, Cherry Blossom Festival is Saturday, 9.30 to 5 o'clock downtown at the courthouse. Uh, so join us on Saturday as well, if you like, to see uh, some other Japanese culture and some Japanese food on Saturday. Thank you. Thank you.